Hello, everybody. Welcome. We'll start the webinar at the top of the hour. That's just about a minute from now. Okay, that is the top of the hour. Let's get started. Hello, hello. So good afternoon and welcome. My name is Alan Barr at COEH Northern California. And on behalf of NIOSH supported education and research centers throughout the country, we're pleased to present the final installment of the 2020 ERC ergonomics webinar series, where we offer free monthly webinars on various topics on human factors and ergonomics. This collaborative effort on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program aspires to provide access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. Thanks so much for joining us today. As a reminder, participants who log in with their registration email today will receive a link to the recording of the webinar and an evaluation form that will qualify you for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. We have an exciting event coming up that I would like to draw your attention to, and you may register for this on our COEH webpage, Northern California COEH webpage, and it is Physical Human Factors and Ergonomics. It is a course, um, an eight-week course, designed to teach the, you the most current biomechanical, psychophysical, and physiological approaches used to quantify physical exposures and assess MSD risk. It's 100% online and asynchronous. You can view lectures, discussions, and complete homework at your own pace each week with ongoing feedback from your instructor. Um, we analyze, synthesize, and interpret the outputs of multiple ergonomic risk assessment tools, and it's worth 45 contact hours of continuing education credit. And your instructor would be Jim Potvin, PhD, Professor Emeritus at McMaster University. Again, you can register for that course on our COEH Northern California website. Um, for today's webinar, you will be muted during the presentation. However, if you'd like to ask a question, please do so and you can enter it into the Q&A box and we will save some time at the end of the webinar to discuss your questions. Today's webinar is being recorded and it will be made available with past webinars on our COEH Northern California YouTube channel. Please do like and subscribe and help us continue to grow our channel. Today's webinar is titled Fatigue in the Workplace Effects on Health and Performance and Measurement Considerations. And it's been presented by two speakers today, Dr. David Dufresne and Dr. Nathan Fetke, in partnership with the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston and the University of Iowa. And I'll give you a brief bio on our speakers today. Dr. Freight is an associate professor in the Southwest Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, Department of Epidemiology, Human Genetics and Environmental Sciences at the UT School of Public Health in San Antonio. He earned his PhD in Occupational Ergonomics and Safety from Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. He also holds a master's in physical therapy from the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, Texas, and a Master of Business Administration from the University of Mary Hardin Baylor in Belton, Texas. Dr. Dufray earned his bachelor's in kinesiology from Texas A&M. He's a certified professional ergonomist and a safety professional. His research and outreach focus for the past 19 years is focused on the prevention of worker injuries and musculoskeletal disorders through the application of ergonomic principles. And then Dr. Fetke, is an associate professor in the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health at the University of Iowa, where he directs the ergonomics training program with the NIOSH-funded Heartland Center for Occupational Health and Safety. In addition, 
Dr. Fetke is Associate Director of the NIOSH-funded Healthier Plains Center for Agricultural Health. His research interests include theoretical and practical considerations for the use of direct measurement methods to assess the physical demands of work, as well as the epidemiology of musculoskeletal outcomes among working people. And that was quite a mouthful. And with that, it's my pleasure to hand the mic over to our guest speakers for today. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate, appreciate the introduction. This is Dave Dufrate uh, here in the, my uh, COVID bunker in San Antonio. I appreciate the opportunity to present today with my friend and colleague, Dr. Fetke at the University of Iowa. Today's lecture is very fitting uh, as we are approaching the end of a very uh, challenging year due to the pandemic and just really the end of year um, times. And so I'm sure many of you, like myself, are experiencing fatigue <laughs> with uh, most everything that we do. So today's discussion and presentation is, is about fatigue in the workplace. And um, by the end of today's lecture, I um, hope that you uh, understand a little bit more about the different perspectives of uh, fatigue, uh, how we define fatigue, and some of what the uh, some of the ramifications of worker fatigue on the health and safety and, and performance of workers. And then we're also going to talk about and present uh, some of the few approaches to measuring fatigue in the workplace. So here's this very simple outline uh, which mirrors those objectives. We're going to define fatigue among workers. Going to talk a little bit about sleep and shift work and the effects of fatigue. And then we're going to talk about the measurement and we'll talk about some of the NIOSH resources that are out there. So our first section uh, is to try to uh, explain and define what worker fatigue is. And so first and foremost, I'd like for all of our listeners to understand is that fatigue really has uh, no single definition. There are so many different concepts and dimensions of fatigue. And to be able to manage uh, fatigue and mit mitigate its effects and risk, we need to understand all of these different components. And first and foremost, we need to understand that fatigue is, is very multidimensional in nature. We can look at it as the acute effects of, of fatigue or even the chronic effects. It can be looked at from a whole body fatigue perspective or, or even down to specifically uh, the muscle level. We can think of it as physical in nature, cognitive or mental in nature, uh, looking at the central or peripheral nervous systems. And then also we cannot neglect the effects of fatigue on not just the worker health and safety, but also on the worker performance. And this is where the business perspective comes into play. And I think, and Dr. Fetke and I have had numerous, numerous discussions on this, that oftentimes work, work sites and employers uh, fail to uh, recognize the effects of fatigue on worker performance. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. So here are some definitions that are out there in the, in the literature of different approaches uh, to define fatigues. We have the exercise phys physiology approach uh, that often looks at the maximal force generation of a muscle or even the specific muscle physiology, uh, looking at what we often refer to as localized muscle fatigue. And we often use uh, electromyography to study the, uh, the, the electrical uh, characteristics of muscle excitation and how fatigue may manifest itself in that way. Uh, we look at motor control, um, and you know, how performance may be uh, disrupted, not just in the context of muscle force generation, but the quality of motion. Uh, psychology, we cannot neglect uh, the cognitive effects of uh, fatigue and which um, the psycho psychological approach is a state of weariness related to reduced motivation per se. Here are some others, neuromuscular, uh, perspective, an increase in the perceived effort necessary to exert a desired force. We have the production or an industrial perspective, which is the diminished personal capacity of doing work. 
uh, a, a decline of productivity or performance decrement is often the term that is used uh, to measure a person's ability to perform work or how fatigue may affect their work performance. And then lastly, uh, the, the medicine approach, the medical approach or a lack of energy that affects mental and physical activity and that could be attributable to not just uh, um, a lack of fitness, but also certain diseases could, man could result in fatigue. So looking at those different um, definitions, um, I wanted to bring up a few variables that need to be considered when we think about fatigue and that's sleep and shift work and then also working hours. And as you might expect, sleep and the typical circadian function are very important considerations that we need to consider uh, as we approach work or fatigue. Um, research shows that sleep and the brain and the body are busy getting ready for the next day at work. It is that time that the body rests, it recuperates from a long day's work or other activities, and it's getting itself ready for the new day. And research has shown that uh, by several different organizations that we need between seven and, uh, seven and nine hours of sleep per day uh, for, hot, for optimal health. Recent research has shown an increasing um, percentage of people that are not getting uh, enough sleep during the, uh, at night or during their sleep time. Um, it, Research has showed in 85 and 1990, 24% of working adults uh, got less than six hours of sleep per day. Whereas in between 2017 and, eight, and 18, that number, that percentage had increased to 32.6% of the workforce not getting enough sleep or six hours per day. So this is a, an interesting, um, data point um, that we need to consider is all, you know, is the workforce getting enough sleep? Not only are they getting enough sleep, are they getting quality sleep to prepare them for the next work day? So there are some certain factors that need to be taken into consideration in the workplace that can negatively impact sleep. Shift work is one of those. Back in 2004, the BLS uh, data showed that 15% of, of the American workforce engaged in shift work. That number had increased to nearly 30% in 2010. And so as we think about shift work and what that is, there are three primary different uh, shifts that uh, define different uh, industrial um, sectors. The night shift, primarily between 9 p.m. and 8 a.m., 8 a.m., as you might imagine, that's where the most health and safety risks take place. Um, myself, I do a lot of research in agriculture and primarily in the dairy industry. And so these dairy operations are 24-7 operations. And what I have observed is that uh, many of the injuries uh, and safety incidents take place at night for a number of reasons. But one of those could be related to just worker fatigue. And so that is something that needs to be considered. An evening shift, uh, most hours between 2 p.m. and midnight, this is the second most um, uh, time period where health and safety risks occur. And then the typical day shift, that's between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. So oftentimes when we think of fatigue, we often think of those jobs that are more uh, physically laborious, uh, that, but we also cannot uh, neglect the service and knowledge-based type of work where there's an increasing proportion of workers that are working greater than 50 hours per week uh, schedules. In a um, 2010 National Health Interview Survey, 20% of workers worked more than 48 hours per week and nearly approaching 10% of, of those workers were approaching 60 or more hours per week. So that's a lot of work. That's a lot of hours worked uh, during a work week. And so we need to take that into consideration. And so uh, as an employer or as a health and safety professional, we need to take this into consideration as we think about fatigue and we think about 
worker performance as the week goes on, the temporal manifestations of fatigue. And you might want to think about as the week goes on, and we're getting to those later days during the week, um, where workers may be at increased risk for error, increased risk for safety incidents, and increased risk for, for injury. So and that is something uh, that should be taken into consideration. But worker fatigue is not necessarily uh, only related to working hours. Um, there are new forms of work that are out there. We have new realities across all industrial sectors, especially right now during the COVID environment. Um, new forms of work have led to increased levels of physical as well as mental fatigue. We have new strategies for work shifts, uh, new working times. We have uh, workers that are being granted flexible working hours, different uh, shifts of work. Uh, we have new types of employment, temporary work, um, knowledge-based work, new forms of business that are 24-hour operations. We live in a global economy to where we, uh, many employers are dealing with customers or other businesses in other parts of the world. And so conference calls, uh, meetings are taking place via uh, virtual environments at the oddest of work times. And so that also needs to be taken into consideration as um, you know, the reality of globalization. And we have changes in work processes. We have lean manufacturing uh, approaches, Lean Six Sigma as uh, is a new production, of, well, not a new production approach. It's been around for several years, many decades. But as you try to minimize uh, downtime, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and then the concept of work intensification is another uh, variable that needs to be considered. And then, as I previously mentioned, we have the implications of new or modified COVID-19 working environments. We have many workers that are working from home now, uh, including myself. I had to adjust to uh, giving lectures from home, having meetings from home, and then also for many of our working um, uh, folks who have kids, who have a spouse, who might also be under the same constraints. And so there are a lot of dynamics and just a lot of cognitive um, new pressures that are being placed on us that can contribute to the development of fatigue. We also have some other personal factors that can impact sleep as well as fatigue. Uh, the workers that are out there may have been diagnosed with different sleeping disorders or may have been uh, given a diagnosis of other chronic illnesses. Um, like I previously, previously mentioned, we have working parents who have infants and small children. I have three teenagers that, as many of you can attest to, can present dynamics and other sources of frustration or fatigue. Um, many folks have are caregivers for uh, sick or disabled family members. Um, a lot of uh, people have long commutes to their work, to and from work, which presents uh, new dynamics. And we have family crises that lead to stress. All of these can contribute to the development of fatigue, which may impact uh, their performance or even their health. As I previously mentioned, uh, we have different approaches where those of us in the health and safety world that are protecting the health and safety of workers, we are trying to mitigate or even prevent fatigue in the workplace. And sometimes that involves uh, designing work schedules and work practices that incorporate uh, rest breaks, which is contrary to uh, production systems. And because in modern uh, production system theory, waiting times or downtimes are often considered unproductive. And it often conflicts with those solutions that we may propose that are aimed to minimize fatigue via rest allowances. Keep in mind that you know, the lean production uh, approach is that any downtime, downtime is non-value added to production. And so anytime that we introduce or suggest or propose new work strategies that incorporate rest breaks, 
that could be uh, interpreted as non-value added time. And so we need to think about that and how we propose new strategies to combat workplace fatigue. So the third section that, that I'd like to bring to your attention that some of you may already be aware of are some of the ramifications of worker fatigue. And so some of those short-term consequences may be just general discomfort in the workplace. As the day goes on, workers may experience increased musculoskeletal discomfort. Um, they may experience diminished motor control to where their general motions and how they perform specific work tasks may not be as smooth and efficient um, as they were in the early hours of a work shift or even in the later uh, work week as, com as compared to the early in the work week. We have uh, the effects of reduced proprioception and also increased muscle muscular force variability and then also reduced strength capability, the simple inability to generate force production uh, by different muscle groups. Some other short-term consequences, like we mentioned, reduced performance and lowered productivity, and then also deficits in just general work quality, how well you are doing the job. And then lastly, increased incidence of safety incidents and human errors in the workplace. So some research have equated the, to the, uh, of the, they've equated the development of uh, worker fatigue to uh, alcohol intoxication. Uh, one study by Dawson and Reed said 17 hours of awake is similar to having a blood alcohol uh, content level of 0.05%. Even uh, 24 hours awake is similar to having a blood alcohol content of 0.10, 0.10%. And so if it's a nice communication um, uh, approach to uh, presenting the ramifications of fatigue to decision makers in an employer, uh, at an employer, or even uh, among workers themselves is to try to explain as your fatigue, uh, your ability to make decisions and perform your work is impaired. Research has shown other associations to fatigue. Like I said, mistakes or poor, uh, just general poor performance, vehicular collisions, and this oftentimes take place, takes place as uh, workers are driving home from work. Um, there have been associations with a lack of exercise and smoking or other stimulants. Um, I often see in agriculture, the use of stimulants, caffeine uh, stimulant drinks being used by uh, different working groups uh, to just help them make it through the day, long working hours. And so you see that oftentimes. Uh, difficulties with mood and personal relationships and then also injuries has been established uh, in the literature. And then lastly, uh, injury risk is also associated uh, with that. Injury risk is dependent on the injury mechanism and the characteristics of work. And some parameters that need to be taken into consideration is basically the length of time between, uh, between breaks. Uh, how often workers are given the uh, a time to take a, maybe if it's a five, 10 minute break, how, uh, when those rest breaks are interspersed throughout a work shift, how long those rest breaks uh, are, could be five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, the work pace, how fast the worker is being asked to work, um, particularly in um, assembly line work or other fast paced production work environments. Like I said, the timing of rest breaks is an issue or a variable to be considered. And the temporal pattern of loading, uh, the biomechanical loading, uh, the frequency, the intensity, and the duration of the different tasks that are being performed by the worker. And then also we cannot uh, forget about the psychosocial stress, the cognitive stress that might be uh, placed on the worker. Um, uh, during a work shift. That can also add to the cognitive uh, fatigue experienced by the worker. Long-term uh, health risk, um, 
many research studies have established that fatigue has been associated with cardi cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, uh, GI disorders, obesity, infections, musculoskeletal disorders, reproductive problems, and then also cancer has also been established to have an association uh, with fatigue. A little bit about the impacts of fatigue on the employer, the business. As you see here, multiple uh, um, research studies have shown uh, that diminished productivity can result, uh, increase in worker errors in the workplace, absenteeism, increased employee turnover, or a failure to retain skilled workers, increased costs for healthcare and workers' compensation, and then also early disability among workers. We have some economic consequences to society. Uh, estimated fatigue-related cost to the economy has been up to uh, 411 billion in the US. Drill that down to between $2,000 and $10,000 per employee. Uh, research has uh, shown to uh, be associated with uh, or estimated to fatigue related costs. We have other impacts to the community itself. We have medical errors in the healthcare setting, industrial disasters. And then uh, as I alluded to previously, 20% of vehicular crashes are due to dr uh, drowsy driving. And I just put one newspaper article. I uh, scratched out the uh, employer or the employee, employee's name there but a driver was sentenced to 21 months in jail for causing a fatal accident after falling asleep at the wheel. He was on his way back, on his way to work on the early morning of October 3rd when he fell asleep and crashed uh, in a head-on collision with a truck. Uh, the courts have upheld uh, pretty sizable um, uh, verdicts um, related to shift work and fatigue. Shift work and long hours are known risk factors both drowsy drivers and their employers have been penalized when a crash uh, has resulted in a death, unfortunately. So there are multiple court cases where millions of dollars have been awarded to, um, to different parties because of the result of worker fatigue related deaths. So that's, uh, that is um, the, the impacts to society, the impacts to the worker itself, impacts to the um, employer as well. So my colleague, Dr. Fetke is now gonna take over. He's gonna uh, present to you some different approaches to fatigue measurement. And so I'm gonna control the screen from my end just to minimize the disruption in the technology. So Nate, it's all yours. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> so as uh, as Dave and I were, were preparing this particular talk and um, <clears throat> my task uh, became one of trying to identify and, and talk about different approaches to measuring fatigue. It's a, it's a fairly daunting task because uh, you know, we just heard a lot of information about the different aspects of fatigue, the different manifestations of fatigue, the different impact, impacts of fatigue. And if you spend any time thinking about measuring fatigue <clears throat> in a work environment, it quickly becomes a a, uh, a challenge trying to sort through the universe of available methods. So uh, go ahead, next slide, Dave. So I thought what I would do is, is distill um, a few things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about methods for estimating localized uh, muscle fatigue, number one. Um, and then I'll talk about some other instruments. But the, the main thrust here is that uh, the approaches that I'm going to describe here are all suitable uh, for use in field settings or, or in practice. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a large number of, of methods uh, available in lab settings that require some more complex equipment. Uh, I decided to forego talking about uh, most of those uh, approaches uh, and, and focus on things that, that we can do in the field with workers in, in practice. And, and again, I'm gonna start with, with localized muscle fatigue. So. Uh, thinking back to the definitions that they presented, um, thinking about fatigue uh, as a reduced capacity uh, of a specific muscle or joint um, to produce force or torque. And so 
Uh, on the left side, I've got uh, you know, a few a few things listed. Then on the first uh, item there, ratings of perceived exertion, self-reports of pain. So these are self-report methods. Uh, the ACGIH special limit value for upper limb fatigue is is maybe a, a combination of observation and, and a little bit of measurement, perhaps. And then there's also some direct measurement methods. Um, so starting at the top, ratings of perceived exertion, self-report ratings of pain using visual analog scales, uh, body discomfort maps. Um, these are relatively simple and, and fairly intuitive instruments to capture worker perceptions. You know, how are they feeling uh, in terms of their exertion level at a particular joint or in terms of their pain level at a particular body area? So in terms of really quantifying or characterizing fatigue, it, it's nice to have repeated assessments over the course of some duration of work, whether it's a few hours or, or even a whole day. Uh, and in general, uh, self-report ratings of, of fatigue, exertion, um, tend to increase uh, in a monotonic, if not linear fashion, with the duration of continuous work activity. Um, disadvantages to, to self-report, somewhat nonspecific. So it may be difficult for a worker, for example, to separate a, a feeling of discomfort at the shoulder from, from maybe the neck or, or upper back. Um, so we have to use a little bit of, of caution there. Um, go ahead, uh, Dave, next. So the ACGIH threshold limit value for, for upper limb fatigue, this was published in 2016. Um, so with this particular method, we, we, we are focusing on, on cyclic work only. So this is a, a method that's suitable only for cyclic work. And I have that listed as one of the disadvantages. And in fact, cyclic work of at least two hours in duration. Um, so the, the method um, requires us to determine the duty cycle of exertion within, within the work cycle, and then to estimate the force levels of exertion within the cycle where each exertion is estimated then as a proportion of uh, the maximal capacity. One thing that's nice about the TLVs um, is that they do provide a constraint for task design. So if we have uh, a duty cycle, uh, then we can identify appropriate force levels and, and vice versa. So if we have force levels, then we can, then we can design for a particular duty cycle. Uh, again, it's only appropriate for the upper limb, so the hand, wrist, the elbow, the shoulder. Um, and it's important to recognize that in most work settings, um, there's a, maybe a few cases where, where this is not the case, but in, in most work settings, um, force, the exertion of force, the experience of force, it, it's really a, a time varying phenomenon. So you may have multiple exertions happening within a work cycle, and those exertions may be in different postures. And so then we need to kind of estimate uh, the, the percent of max for each of those exertions. Go ahead, next slide. So this is, this is the, uh, the TLV approach uh, as published um, by the ACGIH in, in 2016. On the left side, we see a time history of exertion level where exertion is quantified as a proportion of the maximum voluntary contraction. Um, and we see, you know, for example, a 25 second cycle, we see varying hand exertion levels from 10% of an MVC all the way up to 40% of an MVC. And then on the right side, we have the TLV uh, graph itself and, and the equation for the TLV. So starting on the left side, you know, we could look at this time history of, of exertion levels and, and compute uh, the duty cycle. So this would be the time with non-zero MVC. And in this case, it, it would equate to about 40% of that cycle would be considered a time with non-zero exertion levels. And then the MVC um, is calculated then or estimated then as the average or the mean level of the exertions with non-zero MVC. Okay, and in this case, it would be about 15%. So then we can use those values on the right side to identify where this particular task is relative to the, the MVC plot. And we see that, that uh, log relationship where uh, you know, the duty cycle, as the duty cycle increases, uh, the allowable average percent MVC decreases. And, and in the case of the example on the left, uh, the, the TLV is not exceeded. When we think about the TLV as a, as a means for uh, design, right? Given the 40% duty cycle uh, on the left side, you know, if we if we sort of extend um, up from 40%, we we should see that the exertion level should not exceed 20% MVC. 
And likewise, for a 15% NVC, on average, the duty cycle should not exceed 60%. So when we think about uh, merging um, this technique for uh, characterizing upper limb fatigue with something like like lean, um, you know, if lean, if the if one of the goals of lean is to minimize non-value added or waiting time, right? So lean might might act to increase the duty cycle, uh, in other words, decreasing the amount of time with non-zero MVC, and so we can use this relationship. Uh, to work with uh, lean engineers in terms of, well, if you're going to increase the duty cycle, then the force levels have to come down. Uh, so that's one way in which this tool can be, can be used to sort of help um, merge the, uh, the goals of, of lean and production engineering with ergonomics. Go ahead, next slide. There are also a variety of direct measurement approaches to quantifying localized muscle fatigue. Uh, we can measure the maximum, for example, grip strength. If we have a hand intensive activity, we could measure the maximum shoulder torque uh, using dynamometers or other force sensors. Um, as with ratings of perceived exertion, self-report ratings of pain, we can do repeat assessment over time. And we could also do continuous monitoring with something like electromyography, which characterizes electrical signals associated with muscle contraction. Um, what we get when we have direct measurement particularly electromyography and other motion analysis techniques like the use of inertial sensors um, to measure motion quality uh, or motion, other motion characteristics. We have uh, data that's specific to a particular muscle or joint. We have rich data for analysis and interpretation, but it does come with costs. Some, some equipment can be costly. Electromyography equipment in general is, is quite costly and typically not used uh, or available to practitioners uh, broadly. Um, Motion analysis sensors like inertial sensors or accelerometers, uh, these are more broadly available, but still uh, there has some technical expertise requirement that comes with that. And depending on the complexity of the sensors um, that, that we use, uh, we could be potentially disruptive to production. Electromyography is an example of that. So we need to place the sensor over the muscle of interest. We need to do some calibration routines. Uh, that can start to take up quite a bit of time that may be unpalatable uh, for the employer or, or even the employee. Next slide. Uh, other instruments um, that have been reported for use in, in the field, and, and these are primarily, other than the last, these are primarily uh, self-report instruments or questionnaires of some kind. The first here is the Sam Pirelli fatigue scale. Uh, this one was actually uh, developed initially for aviation to assess the fatigue status of pilots to see if they were fit for duty, essentially. It's one item and with seven possible responses, so it just takes a couple of seconds to complete. Uh, one thing it does do is, uh, again, this is not an instrument for localized muscle, muscle fatigue, uh, localized fatigue. This is an instrument for uh, other aspects of fatigue. Um, it does blend if you look at the responses, it does blend physical and cognitive aspects of fatigue. So it can be difficult to disentangle the two if that's what you're interested in. So for example, uh, response uh, item six there says extremely tired, difficult to concentrate. Well, tired conveys physical uh, aspect of fatigue. Well, con difficult to concentrate conveys a, a mental or cognitive aspect of fatigue. So we have to be a little careful, uh, you know, if we really want to as I, as I said, disentangle the physical aspects from the cognitive aspects, um, this may not be the most appropriate scale, although this is very easy to do and, and very quick. Next. The Epsworth sleepiness scale. Um, again, the next two, Epsworth and Stanford, assess sleepiness. Um, this particular scale is widely published, widely used, particularly in clinical settings. Uh, where we're trying, where clinicians may be interested in, in the impact of something like sleep apnea. Uh, this has, uh, this particular scale has eight items, uh, four possible responses per item, and the total score then would be the, the sum uh, of the scores from, from each of the eight individual items. And the intention of this scale is, is not to do sort of momentary uh, or repeated assessment of, of sleepiness over the or at, at moments in time. It's, it's really about general experiences over the course of the day. Next. And the Stanford sleepiness scale, um, in contrast 
to the Epsworth really is designed for sort of in the moment or momentary assessment. So if we presented this particular scale uh, at intervals over the course of a, a continuous duration of, of work, then we could, we could capture the temporal pattern. Um, as with uh, many other uh, instruments, when, when using the Stanford, we do have to be cognizant that, that people will come with different baseline sleepiness, particularly those with shift work, uh, you know, maybe working third shift, uh, comparing third shift workers to first shift workers may be, may be a little bit tricky with, with this kind of a scale. Next. The Swedish Occupational Fatigue Inventory is an instrument that many may be familiar with. Um, this is a, uh, again, uh, uh, 20 items in this scale. Each item has a, an ordinal response from uh, a score of zero, which is anchored as, as not at all, to a score of six, which is anchored as to a very high degree. So these are words or phrases that convey different, uh, different aspects of, of fatigue. So with these 20 items then, uh, we can derive uh, subscales, four items per subscale. So the sub subscales are the physical exertion, discomfort, lack of motivation, sleepiness, lack of energy. So this particular scale uh, would give us a, a broader assessment of fatigue along multiple dimensions, the physical dimension, uh, perhaps the uh, aspects of the, the cognitive uh, dimension and, and sleepiness and so forth. Go ahead and click. And so, for example, uh, if we if we take the scores from breathing heavily, out of breath, sweaty, and palpitations, and compute the mean of the individual item scores, uh, that gives us the physical exertion subscale uh, subscale score, and and that uh, framework is used for the other subscales as well, just with different uh, different items. Next. And then uh, the psychomotor vigilance test, this is not a self-report instrument. This is actually a, a, a direct, uh, an approach to directly measuring, uh, and what it measures is reaction time. So you see an example on the right where uh, the, the worker or participant would be presented with a screen. Uh, you see a, a, a stimulus in a yellow box and that stimulus would be presented at random intervals. And, and the goal uh, is for the, for the, for the, uh, the person taking the test is to tap the screen as fast as possible when, when, when seeing that stimulus. So it measures reaction time. Um, so along with reaction time, we get, we get measures of things like errors or, or you know, false starts, some stuff like that. Um, so uh, psychomotor vigilance has been described in, in some settings as a proxy for, for injury risk. And, and, and mainly in occupational settings in which, in which there is unpredictability uh, in the situation that a worker may, may face. And a, and a good example may come from agriculture, working with livestock, uh, for example, um, who may behave unpredictably um, and you may have a propensity for, for kicking a worker. And if, if a worker has a decrement in terms of psychomotor vigilance, that could put them at uh, greater risk for not being able to get out of the way uh, quick enough to avoid that to avoid that uh, that occurrence. Next, and there are a variety of other technologies, emerging technologies. Uh, there's two here: uh, actigraphy and, and heart rate variability. Um, you know, commercial grade, uh, consumer grade electronics these days, Apple Watches and Fitbits. Uh, are starting to produce measures of sleep duration and quality. Some are starting to produce measures of heart rate variability. Uh, and there's some uh, literature around both of these uh, types of approaches for, uh, for, for measurement. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned that's not on this slide is a, a relatively um, recent and fairly active uh, line of, of research, which is uh, using multiple wearables uh, that measure multiple biophysical signals. So we may have heart rate monitoring paired with inertial sensing of body motion. Maybe the inertial sensors are placed on the wrist and on the trunk. And, and so uh, there are some out there that are trying to leverage features of these signals and create using machine learning approaches or artificial intelligence uh, approaches, create uh, models for fatigue detection based on a suite of wearable technologies. So that, that's a, uh, 
an approach that that's emerging and I expect to see more and more research in that in that area um, over the next couple of years. Next. So I think the, the, the message here on measurement, you know, I presented a few techniques, a few approaches for localized fatigue, for other aspects of fatigue. It's important to remember that fatigue is, is not unidimensional, right? There's, there's all kinds of forms out there, different de definitions, different aspects of fatigue. And, and a single test is not likely to sufficiently capture uh, every, everything. So as practitioners, uh, it's important that we develop a toolkit, become comfortable with a variety of tools, understand their purpose, understand their advantages and their limitations. Uh, number one, so that we can be adaptable uh, to different scenarios when, when fatigue measurement is warranted, uh, but then also making sure that we are using um, instruments that are capturing the constructs that we're really interested in. And as always, when we talk about doing work in a practice setting or in the field, there's a balance between the information um, that we can collect and, and feasibility. You know, it's one thing to ask a worker to provide a rating of perceived exertion. Um, it's another altogether to say, I want to put EMG electrodes all over your shoulder girdle and measure the, the fatigue status of the anterior deltoid and upper trapezius uh, over the course of eight hours. Okay, so um, again, it's always a balance between information and feasibility. Next. So Dave, I'll kick it back to you. Yeah, I just wanted to put a slide up here on a very nice website uh, put out by the uh, by NIOSH. It talks about work schedule, shift work, long hours, and they provide a multitude of great uh, different resources, publications um, out there. So I'll draw your attention to that uh, if you have uh, any further questions or or um, question, you know, questions related to fatigue. So with that, I think we went 45 minutes there. And I think that we will open it up for some, for some questions if there are any. There are questions, in fact, and I will deliver some to you. I think the nature of the question sort of speaks to the, um, the complexity and the nuance surrounding this topic. So um, we'll see how many of these we can get through. Um, I just wanted to say that, David, I like your qu I'm quoting here, teenagers presenting dynamics that contribute to the development of fatigue. I thought that might be the quote of the day for me. Um, although my kids are not teenagers yet, they still present those very dynamics. So with that, um, somebody asks, asks about um, the um, perhaps any data on fatigue yet related to the, the long haulers, the COVID-19 survivors and their, their subsequent um, ailments from surviving COVID-19 uh, with respect to fatigue. Is there anything going on with that yet? You know, that's a very good question, and I'm sure there will be. I have I have not seen it, uh, the research, uh, but this is a, a great question. Um, Nate, do you have, um, are you aware of any studies that are going on that, that are looking at this on, on the COVID, those who have uh, come down with COVID and are recovering from that and longer term sequelae of that? I, I'm not aware of any ongoing studies. I, I'd, be, I'd be immensely interested in learning if anybody does. I would too. Me too. Um, okay, so next question. Um, have there been any studies or any data to support uh, or quantify the increase of production with respect to uh, uh, when you have rest breaks being offered by a, an employer? Yeah, I know, um, <laughs> Chris, good question. This, this is a good example of different, um, different definitions. My first thought was forced production, but you could look at it from industrial production. Um, so that's a good question. This is where I think research, uh, there needs to be more research, is tying in worker fatigue, not just on the health and safety of the worker, but on their performance and on their productivity. Um, I know that the, the research is limited and it's and is what uh, Nate presented, I think one of his last slides. This is very difficult to quantify inside the workplace if you're even allowed to as a researcher to get into the workplace, but as a health and safety professional, uh, coming up with the definitions of productivity, how are you gonna define productivity? And then being able to, to measure 
and, and um, collect multiple data points over the course of time to see that change. Um, so I'm not aware of studies that have got that it, that have resulted in enough data with enough fidelity to get down to that level. Nate, are you aware of any? Yeah, I, I, I muted in the wrong direction. Not specifically. I, I am aware of a couple of papers that were published in the in the early 2000s and um, around 2001 to 2005 related to rest breaks on. On productivity, I, I think one of the papers was focused on meatpacking workers, meatpacking scenarios, and introducing different temporal patterns of rest breaks and, and the effects there on productivity. Um, I think there's some other work, uh, more broad, about the impact of rest breaks on on performance. Um, maybe not productivity per se, but performance. Um, so if you know, I'm, I'm I can try and track down at least links to those to those papers to to share. Um, might take me a little bit, you know. Okay. Point. All right. Thank you. I, I have a question related to the, the sort of liability, I suppose, for employers. And I'm wondering what steps could em, can employers take to protect their employees from the risks associated with fatigue um, uh, on and off the job, but when, especially with respect to when they leave the workplace and perhaps they're driving um, while fatigue, the fatigue is a direct result of the work they just performed or the hours they just worked. Um, are there any um, apps available for self-screening uh, post-shift? Um, anything like that that's, that employers could sponsor perhaps? Yeah, that's a good question. I have uh, come across a few apps and I cannot, I can't name them off the top of my head, but there are some apps that are being used out there to self monitor um, if you're experiencing fatigue. I know pilots, there are some out there for pilots. Um, so, you know, a lot of the research that is out there, I know a lot of research has been conducted on uh, nurses. And so, when they come off of a 12 hour shift, because there's the research that I've have seen is a lot of uh, on the road accidents. Um, a lot of the, the workers that have been studied are nurses going home off of a, a long work shift. And so this is a great example of, um, you know, of what an employer can do in their fatigue management program uh, to help, um, you know, monitor workers, be aware of it, there needs to be a lot of uh, worker education for them to self-monitor themselves, to be able to, you know, know when, you know, they're at greater risk for incidents. Um, so, yeah, so that's a great question um, as far as some tools to be used. It's all part of a greater or a much larger uh, fatigue management program by an employer. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Nate's uh, typing an answer to, uh, to, to one of the questions and that's really good. Um, in the meantime, I'll just ask you uh, di directly here, what are the 20% of factors reasoned to cause or exacerbate workplace fatigue that are responsible for 80% of the near misses or accidents, injuries associated with workplace fatigue? Oh, good question. Talking about Pareto principle there. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, I mean, you have to really drill down into what's taking place in the, in the workplace, what the tasks that are being performed, are they cognitive, are they whole body, are they muscular related? Um, and then the temporal pattern of those, if we call them exposures. Um, and then just the, the time period of the, the rest allowances during the break. So I don't know, I mean, you kind of have to look at the whole the work being done itself uh, and really analyze what is being done. What are the cognitive stressors and the physical stressors that are, that are taking place? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, a few more questions coming in. What role does personal responsibility have in fatigue regarding fitness for duty and job selection? Well, from <laughs> You want to take a shot at that? I don't know. This is being recorded. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, I think every worker has a personal responsibility to take care of themselves and and make sure that they are able to perform uh, the functions of the job. 
Um, also, there is a responsibility of the employer uh, to provide a safe working environment. And part of that is uh, recognizing that work factors can contribute to the development of fatigue. And so I think it's a two-way street. I think there's some there's responsibility on both ends, but uh, from an employer perspective and from a health and safety professional, I think that a worker needs to be aware that they need to take care of themselves and make sure that they're you know, getting enough sleep as well as making sure that their body is in a, uh, um, in a condition to perform the, the functions of the job. Yes. Um, okay, <clears throat> I'll just keep moving down the list here. Um, are there any uh, optimal work rest? Is there a, an, a, an optimal work rest ratio uh, for timing of breaks? Um, yeah. Good question. Oh, want to sorry. tackle that one? Sorry? Do you want to tackle that one as far as optimal less work rest schedules or strategy? Um, I think what I'll say is um, I don't think there's a magic bullet, at least that I have I have read about or heard about. Um, you know, I hear differing opinions, and I read um, differing uh, outcomes in different research articles. I think um, it's important to consider the biological plausibility of rest breaks, and there's no reason to to think that adding a break or extending a break um, is going to do harm. Um, I just don't know that that and sort of an optimal um, break schedule has ever been identified. David, I don't know if you want to add on to that. Yeah, and this is a question that I have often had. You know, you hear of different workshops being designed with a 15 minute rest break in the morning, 15 minute in the afternoon with a 30 minute lunch break. Um, and there are, are uh, labor regulations uh, that, that uh, address that. But I've often wondered where the 15 minute comes from. Um, why could you not have three five minute breaks to constitute a 15? Uh, what could a simple, you know, I tell uh, those in the, you know, in agriculture and dairy operations that 24 seven, uh, not the workers, but cows are being milked 24 seven. So they, workers often are working 12 hour shifts. Just a simple five minute break of getting outside and, and getting in the sunshine. Um, I don't have any data that supports, you know, that five minute rest period, but there is value in uh, incorporating task variability, even if it means a change of scenery. And I saw that uh, there was a question in there about lighting you know, being in different lighting environments or being in a suboptimal environment and getting them out in the sunshine or just a different environment can go a long way. So when we talk about rest, it doesn't necessarily mean just sitting and not moving. Rest could mean uh, a number of different things, including just doing something different, a different task. Somehow integrating or incorporating task variability can go a long way. So I think, I'll, uh, I think there is opportunity for further research in that regards. There was a question, I can't find it now because I've got too many in front of me, but it was asking if the ACGH TLV um, was only useful with respect to EMG and did you need to use uh, EMG uh, to, to use that tool? So I responded to that question, but the, oh, answer, good. Okay, the, answer, is, the answer is no. Um, you know, EMG is one possible approach to estimating force. Another is to is if you were able to uh, measure the absolute force requirement. Say, what is the what is the pinch force needed? What is the grip force needed uh, to insert this particular part into this into the assembly or to turn this um, you know this tool? Uh, if you were able to measure those forces um, and had information about the postures in, in which those forces were exerted, um, then you could normalize those absolute forces to population uh, maximum capacities. Uh, so that's, a, that's another approach. And, and again, um, ratings of, of uh, perceived exertion could possibly be used here as well. So there are a variety of methods for, for potentially estimating force. EMG is just one. 
Great, thank you. Uh, so we have, uh, we're not gonna get through all of these. Gentlemen, I, I can see that you have access to these questions in front of you. Are there anything, is there anything in here that jumps off the page at you? Um, since we're certainly not gonna be able to get through all of them. No, I, I just like to say that I appreciate everybody's questions and, and, you know, as I have in my limited time as a researcher and dealing with occupational health and safety, you know, fatigue is really um, becoming a, a a large, a bigger interest for me. And I would encourage everyone to, you know, to give us a call or I would love to engage with everyone uh, further on, you know, some collaborative op opportunities if they are made, if they do present themselves, but fatigue does need to be addressed in the research. Um, and I think employers need to be uh, more cognizant and aware of the real implications of fatigue and how they can affect not just performance, but on the worker health and safety. And so I think that we still have a long ways to go, um, but I'm, I like what I'm seeing as far as increased research in this area. I'd like to give a shout out to Claire Caruso at NIOSH. She's done a lot of great research in, in, uh, um, in this concept who has inspired me with some of her presentations, a lot of the material in this presentation. So NIOSH is doing a lot and a lot of my colleagues across the country and across the world are doing it well as well, so. All right, well, we are at the top of the hour and um, David and Nathan, were you, that was a fantastic talk and you heard it here, folks. We have phone numbers on the screen for you and uh, you got an offer to reach out and have your questions uh, answered directly if you would like. Um, I will say that um, you, if you logged in today with your registration email, uh, you will receive a link to an evaluation form and that will qualify you for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. So um, if you'd like to watch this again or share it with friends, you can find it on the COEH uh, Northern California YouTube channel because it has been recorded and it will be published there. And uh, again, I want to say a big thank you very much. Um, there were some um, requests for PDF packets and you may request those directly at coehce at berkeley.edu and we will send that out to you if you would like one. So thank you again so much um, to David and Nate. And uh, this wraps up our ARC ergonomics webinar series for 2020. And I uh, appreciate you all and I'm wishing you uh, happy holidays and we'll talk to you next year. Bye now. Thank you.